Good evening, everyone. My name is Erica Boone. Thank you for joining us for our third installment of Authentic Conversations. The purpose of Authentic Conversations is to help inspire current and aspiring STEM and other health professionals with uplifting personal stories from movers and shakers and fields of STEM and more. Authentic Conversations is a collaborative effort between two groups, the NIH Eight, eight changes for racial equity and the CDC seven acts of change. So what are ACRE and seven acts you might be asking? Well, both are self-assembled groups composed of scientists and other career fields employed at NIH and the CDC that banded together beginning about last year at our respective organizations following a brutal year of racially motivated killings of African-Americans, including George Floyd and the ensuing highly visible year of social justice reckoning that occurred here in this country. Simply put, we had had enough and we wanted to create change within our own institutions and environments. We've been doing that within our own institutions by working with our leadership and our peers within our institutions. And we've also been creating change by working with and supporting each other. Authentic Conversations is kind of a love child that sprang from both groups as a means to share, motivate, inspire, and support. So our last two authentic conversation sessions have focused on redefining the narrative of success in STEM as well as changing the face of STEM. So what's our topic for tonight? Being an innovator in your field. Once we decided on this topic, I could think of no better individual to spotlight than our next guest, Dr. Walter Mark Kimbrough, president of Dillard University of New Orleans. Uh, well, let's run down a bit of information about his bio. Dr. Kimbrough is an AT alien, otherwise known as a native Atlantan. He graduated from Mays High School. I know a lot of people who went to, who attended Mays. He holds degrees from several institutions, including the University of Georgia, Miami University of Ohio, a doctorate from Georgia State. He started off his collegiate endeavors wanting to be a veterinarian, but along the way, he made a life-changing pivot and decided to pursue higher education. Since that point, he's excelled in his career in student affairs, serving at Emory University, Georgia State University, Old Dominion University, which is in my old stomping ground since I'm from Virginia Beach, Virginia. And in 2004, at the age of 37, Dr. Kimbrough became one of the youngest college presidents ever when he assumed the role of president at Philander Smith College. In 2012, Dr. Kimbrough moved on to become president of the first HBCU in the state of Louisiana, Dillard University. He's one of the most sought after voices when it comes to advocacy for HBCUs. He's an author named one of the most interesting college presidents alive. I'd like to be one of the most interesting people alive, too. Uh, he's a, a very active presence on social media and is known as the hip hop press. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. He's a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated and known in those circles as Crusher or Big Walt. <laughs> More importantly, you wonder how I know that, aren't you? <laughs> More importantly, he's a he has a lovely family. He's a dad of two and is married to a member of the first and finest sorority in the world. In fact, she's my chapter soror, so that means that he's smart and he recognizes a good thing when he sees it. Lastly, I think he's one of my long lost cousins on my daddy's side. So why don't we all welcome Dr. Kimbro? How are you today? I'm good, how are you doing? I'm doing excellent. And I'd like to say thank you to everyone who kind of hung in there with us as we had our little technical difficulties as we started a little bit late. So to help guide the rest of our conversation, I want to start off with a word association game. Is that okay? Okay. Great. So I'm going to give you a word and you're going to give me the first thing that comes to mind. Okay. Nolens. Food. Leadership. Um tough that's fair authenticity it's not one word it's like it's the only way <laughs> that's it. purpose um purpose um constant search trailblazer goal legacy students all right I like that. Well, I know I've just provided a little bit of information about you, but I'd like to continue in that vein by asking you to tell us a little bit about yourself. I knew that you grew up as a preacher's kid. Uh, I can tell, first of all, I can tell that by the way you rock a crowd, but how did your upbringing influence your path and how did you decide upon higher education? 
Um, well, yes. Yeah, so I grew up wanting to be a veterinarian. Um, I don't know where that came from. It was just as a little kid. It was, and so going, I went to Mays, which at the time was a magnet for math and science. So I competed in science projects every year. We had gerbils and rabbits and a dog. We had all the animals at the house and all of that. So that was cool. And so I, I went to Georgia because they had one of the top veterinary schools in the country. And I was like, I'm going to do three years of undergrad, get into vet school early, then become a veterinarian. So I did three years of undergrad. I got in early at Georgia and at Tuskegee. And I said, well, I'm already at Georgia. Let me just stay at Georgia. And so like during the first quarter there, I was like, no, this really shouldn't be this hard. It was just, it got worse and worse and worse, just, you know, and like they were in blocks so that if you had a biochemistry class that was eight weeks, they would tell you that to pass the class, you had to have a 75, not, you know, because if you didn't have, didn't pass, you were out of vet school immediately. And uh-huh. I went into the final with a 76 and they were just like, oh, everybody drops after the final. So I'm sweating, like I'm gonna be gone in the first eight weeks. And actually my grade went up a little bit, but we lost like, eight or 10 people out of our class after the first. So I was like, this is crazy. Um, but I, I got through the first quarter. And at the end of the first quarter, I went to the registrar's office. I was like, I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. And they were like, oh, no, give it a good old college try. So I was like, all right. And of course, I'm, I'm still technically a senior in college. So all of this is still counting toward my degree. So I haven't really lost anything. So the second quarter, we had a neuroanatomy class where 75% of the grade was the final. And a final exam was a brain, I don't know what animal, it was cut and it had pins in it and you had to say what the pin was pointing to. So I went to the final, I was like, oh, y'all, I'm done. This is no way, I'm not <laughs> okay, done. This is happening. This is, and so they were, because it was a high stakes final, they were like, well, you get a second chance to take it. And I was like, all right, I'll take it again. I remember the night before I drove to West Georgia because they had a step show. So I went to the step show at West Georgia and came oh, back. And I was like, I'm done. It doesn't matter. I'm going to go through the motions. Uh, so, but yeah, I was very involved on campus. I, you know, I was. I pledged my freshman year, I became Southern Region Assistant Vice President, so I was over all of the Alpha undergraduate chapters in seven southeastern states. So I got a chance at, during my senior year, which was my year in vet school, to sort of see how the whole thing works. And I'm sitting there with all these college presidents who had served the fraternity in different roles, and I'm sitting next to one, I said, you know what? I know I don't want to be a veterinarian forever. I like being on a campus. Maybe I should be a president. What should I do? So that's where the idea came from. And he was like, yeah, go get a master's in college student personnel. I didn't know what that was, but this guy had been present for 15 years. I was like, I'm doing what he said. And that's sort of, once I got there and I was like, this is what I'm supposed to do. And it was easy after that. But I'm, I'm still thankful for that veterinary school experience and being a STEM person all throughout because I think it helped me develop a level of discipline, a level of looking at numbers and facts. I mean, we're having a conversation with some accreditors today and I'm breaking down how numbers work in terms of how we measure like things like depreciation and I'm taking averages from different schools. That's all this, the STEM background is just a part of me. So I'm thankful for that. So not even finishing vet school was not bad because I mean, I still have a degree in biology, um, but I, STEM is very important for me just in terms of how I process. So that's that's still a benefit. So talking about, about- these things, things, things that help you dig in. Talk about the personality traits and the characteristics that you that think, think that kind of help you get through that particular time in your life. Uh, I think a lot of it is just being a preacher's kid. I think that's, you know, when you grow up and you just sort of, you, you're, you're asking yourself, like, I mean, as far back as I can remember, when little kids say, I want to be a police officer or a doctor, I was like, I want to be a veterinarian. And it was crazy because how many kindergartners are talking about being a veterinarian? That's all I can remember. I remember being like 12 or 13 years old, looking in a book of all the veterinary schools in the country and writing them letters as a as somebody that young seventh grade saying what do i have to do to get into vet school and then excited when they sent me stuff back i mean i'm still six you know i'm six years away from just being in college let alone vet school and i got vet school sending me information so you know it was you know, that was i think part of it too so um you know being in a house like that where my dad's a preacher my mom actually um, she went to Cal Berkeley. She was working in computer software when there were no black women. Her degree is in chemistry and math. So she's double major chemistry, and math, five, eight, a capital. So that's oh, the brains wow. of the family. So, but once she got done with that, 
she also has a master's in Christian education. So she taught religion and philosophy at Clark Atlanta. So when you got all that in your house, you know, it just sort of helps you to develop certain kinds of um, values and, and you lean on your faith. And it's like, okay, this isn't working out. That's, that means I'm not supposed to be doing this. So what am I supposed to do? And then to lean into that. So I think that was, I think for me that, and that's still part of, I think what I do now, just in terms of challenges you have as a president, you just sort of, I don't, things don't really just throw me off because I'm like, okay, this is what it is now. So how do I lean into this? Like all of last year with COVID, it's like, okay, new opportunity. And people just like, oh, it's hard. I'm like, no, new opportunity learning. What are we, what am I supposed to learn from this? What kind of skills do I develop from this? And it's a challenge, but it's like, how do I learn from it? So I, that's how my orientation is. It, 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 sounds, it sounds like, like some, some of the traits, of the traits that, that you, you developed. You're going to echo that you had. had I have forces similar, similar to, to other, other scientists, scientists that I've talked to. Talk to. You. you had you a had sense, sense of empathy growing up, up the pond pond right. where you were. And that, that just, just that goes, goes a long way. way. Right. Also, also my, my dean used to be the dean of students at Talladega and went on to um, um, two, 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 in Mississippi. You had to stick to it. So you were going to see this whole thing through. So when you decided you were going to switch back, and you're going to go to higher education. How did you decide I'm going to be a college president? One of, One my, of my best friends, friends, well, my best friend in the whole wide world, you've met her, her Andrea. Andrea. That's, That's all she's, she's from the time that we were in college. I'm going to be a college yeah. president. How did, How you, did decide you decide that? And then what, 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 what pathway did you pursue? Right. So, like I said, I didn't, I didn't really decide that until I met Walter Washington, who was president of Alcorn State. And it just sort of, it sort of entered my mind because I was so involved on campus at Georgia. And then I sort of realized like, wow, I can get a job working on a campus. So maybe I could be a college president. And so all of these, you know, men that I kept meeting at our conferences and particularly when I started studying college presidents and I saw how many of them were alphas, that just really attracted me too. So I was like, <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah. So it was so once I decided that's what I was going to do, then the scientist in me was like, so let me start studying the past of these people. And I, I, I know I have a clip fold around here. I mean, I got old clippings that are probably 30 years old. I would clip articles out about different presidents and learn about what they did and who did what and just study them and the different kinds of things that they they did and people I could learn from. And I was looking last night at Janetta Cole's book and that she, when it first came out, I was working at Emory and she signed it to a future brother president. And when I became a president, I gave her the book again to sign it again and say, you know, it's fulfilled, that kind of just reflecting on some of those kinds of things. Um, so it's just, I just studied it once I decided that I felt like that was a path. And once I got on that path and I started learning more and I started working at different places, when I worked at Emory, I had a chance to talk to the president to learn from him. When I worked at Georgia State, I saw the president a lot because I ran orientation. So he was at all the orientation sessions. So I got to talk to him <laughs> and then I got to go to lunch with the president at at, um, at Old Dominion. Then when I worked at Albany State, the president, when she hired me, she was like, look, you come work for me in five years, you'll be a president. And less than five years later, I was a president. Listen, so, I don't know. It's, it's about, about filling your destiny. Not even doing the internet. So, so I, I hope that when you make that call, and she signed that book, that was a hot, 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 hot moment for you. Yeah. Yeah, exa no, exactly. Yes, no, she's actually going to speak for our faculty staff institute this year because I just think it's, I mean, we had a conversation a few weeks ago, but yeah, it's just people, I just studied the people and learn from them to say, how do I do this? And they still do it, you know, in my own way, but there were just things I could learn from lots of different people. I mean, being here in New Orleans when Dr. Francis was still president of Xavier and he was president almost 50 years, you know, I went, sat and talked to him for, you know, two hours and I had been a president you know, eight years by that time, but I, coming in New Orleans, I had to learn about these hurricanes. So we had, I mean, he gave me some history about Dillard that was important. And then we talked about how do we navigate the storm season. So um, yeah, all of that. It's just, I'm just a student of my profession. Student of your profession, I like that one. So, so I wanna change, change track a little bit. bit. So you're known for your advocacy yeah. of the use the list. A legacy, a legacy for a little bit. And let's talk about the role of HBCUs and the lives and education of African Americans. 
So, so we, we heard, heard the conversations about whether HBCUs are relics or an right. act the past and if they're still needed. But, but in light right. of what's going on today, what's the renewed role of HBCUs? Has it changed? And, and also, also, does it still bring something special to this, this legacy? legacy? Well, you know, one of the things I've been telling people and I um, have been writing about this is that there was a period of time when people say, are these institutions still relevant um, because you could go to school wherever you wanted to? I mean, I was able to go to University of Georgia, but that was based on a court order in 1961. <laughs> so UGA was not built for somebody like me. I understand that. Um, but people are saying, well, you can go to school wherever you want to now. Why do we need these institutions? And I'm like, there are lots of different institutions. We don't have enough people who are getting college degrees. So why would you take something off of the table that is still producing 20% of black undergraduates? And then when you start looking at blacks with higher level degrees, like masters and doctorates, they disproportionately come for those institutions. So that would be detrimental. But I think there was a period of time when HBCUs relied too much on the civil rights generation for all of their validation. And what I like right now is that in this new period of time, in the last five years, you've seen HBCU graduates play major roles at a national level. And this is a new generation. These are people my age and younger. So it's not just a Kamala Harris as the vice president or a Stacey Abrams in Georgia or a Raphael Warnock being the first black senator or your um, your. Uh, Chapter Soror and Akima Williams, who took John Lewis's seat uh, in Georgia in the, the House of Representatives. It's like when all of this stuff happened with George Floyd and, and white people in particular were trying to figure out how do we learn about racism? They're reading Tana Hesse Coates, who went to Howard. They re they're reading Ibram Kendi, who went to FAMU. Um, you start putting all these pieces together, and it's like, HBCU graduates now are really, they have a hand in so many things. You look at the mayors of Atlanta and New Orleans and St. Paul, Minnesota and Birmingham and Montgomery. And you know what I'm saying? It's, so it's sort of hard to say, how is a, a group of organizations um, or institutions irrelevant at a time when you have these young professionals playing major leadership roles all across the country? So I think that I think part of what HBCUs haven't done is to continue to refresh and not just say, this is who we were. We did all these things. We were born at a time of slavery. It's like, put all that down. What are we doing right now? Who's, who are the movers and shakers right now that are graduates or attended these institutions and what are they doing? And I think that's a powerful message. And so I look for those kinds of things to say, yeah, you know, this is HBCU person, this person, or, you know, the new person who's over MSNBC. HBCU cred. I mean, it's there is like all kinds of places that people didn't know. So I think that's the message that HBCUs have to, to share at this point in time. On top of that, now you do have more black students and parents intentionally saying the racism, even at the K through 12 level, is becoming unbearable. And I want my child just to be in a space where they don't have to deal with that, where that's I can absolutely. be on a campus and I know if you don't like me, it's not because I'm black, you just don't like me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, I think and you're going to hear even more of that as the, the, the fake backlash on critical race theory that nobody even knows what really is starts to keep people from presenting information in schools that young black people are going to be looking for. And they're going to be so hungry for it. They're going to be even drawn more to HBCU. So there will be an impact even from this stuff that's going on now. I, I, I love, love this. It, it, I want to talk, talk a little bit about, about the special, special secret, secret sauce. sauce. That, that HBCUs, HBCUs have. have. Because you, you, you great, great point. point. We're graduating, We're graduating at rates that, that no other institution can do. do. But people, people kind of don't, don't understand how it's, how it's done. done. Right. There, there are resources. resources. There, there are a, a lot of things that we're, that we're, that we're trying, trying to help resolve, resolve in our own institutions. institutions. Uh, uh, we don't we have, have the same brand recognition as other so what well i mean the interesting thing is you got a lot of folks trying to bottle it you have a lot of predominantly white institutions saying how can we learn from hbcus to do a better job on our campuses uh and i think just the overall 
environment of a campus. And, and it's not to say, I think there's still some more work we can do, particularly in some HBCUs. I think we can still do better with some. I mean, so that's when I look at a place like Dillard where almost 80% of my students are Pell Grant eligible, which means they come from families that earn less than $40,000 a year. And if you plug those numbers into a formula at UCLA, you know, my graduation rate should be less than 40%. Just based on socioeconomic and those things. So when I say I got a graduation rate that's over 50 percent, you know, people should be like, how are y'all doing that? But it's creating that environment where, you know, if you know someone is struggling, you reach out and you make the extra effort. And like I said, this isn't something that I just know having worked at HBCUs for, for 20 years. It's me growing up in my house and my mom teaching at Clark and her students who were from the West Coast who couldn't go home for Thanksgiving had dinner with us. Like one of her students, David, we like he's like our our, our other brother because David was, was up with us every year for Thanksgiving. Oh, I love that. So it's like we saw that, you know, just intentional. And so those are the kinds of things that we replicate. So it's it's going above and beyond. It's sometimes it's asking the difficult questions that I mean, even as a president, sometimes I know if I ask a certain question, I'm about to get more than I probably have bargained for, and it's gonna put me on the hook to fix some stuff that that's not really in my job description. But I, you know, I think that people who work at HBCUs, the analogy I like to use, so I like a lot of pop culture. If you go back to, I think it's the first barbershop movie and Cedric the, the Entertainer's character, Eddie, is talking about being a barber. He's like, you know, the barber was the style coach and the, the, the overall pimp. And it's all like all these things that you do. It's not just being a barber. Well, that's when you had an HBCU. It, that's not, you know, I'm not just the president. I'm the relationship coach. I'm the dietitian. I'm the mediator. I'm the, you know, somebody needs a ticket to go to grad school interview. I'm, I'm the financer. That's all part of it. None of that's in my job description. But if somebody emails me and like, Dr. Kimber, I need help with blah, blah, blah. OK, let me call this person and hook this up. For that's part of it. And I think those are the little things that if you do those little things, that might be the difference from someone completing or not completing. And that's something that they remember. And it's like somebody really, you know, had my back for something. And I think that's very important. So I, I think you see that replicated at a great level at HBCUs that you don't uh -huh. see. And like I said, I worked at predominantly white institutions. At Emory, uh -huh. we had some people who would go above and beyond. At Old Dominion, at Georgia State. So they had people like that too. But it, it wasn't the institutional culture. It was individuals within the institution. At the HBCU, that's the institutional culture. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference. I, I, have, I have been, been a, a recipient of that. And we're, we're trying, trying to fix it. So, so forgive me about that one. That one. But, but I've, I've always said that they the the sentiment, sentiment was, was here, here is, is the, goal, the goal. And, and we're, we're going to get you over this. this. And at and other instances, is is there, we'll, we'll see you there. Right. And, and I don't know if you can follow it, but you can follow it like, like, like awesome. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, but like I said, there are, I, I go to conferences, there are people who are very actively um, really trying to figure out how do we um, do what you guys do? And it's just <laughs> like, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if it's that easy, but they are having those conversations trying to figure that trying out. To I didn't want to use that word, but yeah, maybe. <laughs> No, I want to switch uh, gears just a little bit. Um, I read and I heard, I'm sorry, on uh, Malcolm Gladwell's podcast. And I found that really interesting, his take on uh, rankings for colleges and universities and what goes into that and how privilege plays a, such a huge factor on that one. And you had some really strong opinions on it. So let's talk a little bit about Project Builder. And let's talk about um, the impact that these ratings have on uh, institutes that 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 re that educate us, right? Um, because people support the brands that they know. They give money to the brands that they know. And you know, folks know Howard. Folks know Morehouse. Folks know Spelman. Folks know Dillard. A lot of people don't know Talladega. So, you know, where are we on this list? Do we have any hope of being on this list? Because people use this list in order to make decisions about where they're gonna send their kids to school. So let's talk a little bit about 
Project Dillard and talk about um, this podcast with, with Malcolm Gladwell. So that was one of the craziest things because I got this email out the blue that says, hello, my name is Malcolm Gladwell and I'm a journalist. I'm just like, dude, I know who you are. It's like a big deal. It's like a big deal. It's like, I got this podcast. I want to talk to you. I'm like, cool. And then so we start talking and he spent some time in Atlanta. So he's like, yeah, I know your dad, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, this is crazy. So he says, I'm doing this project and I'm looking at rankings. Well, I have hollered and screamed about rankings since I became president of Philander Smith. So this goes back and, and on my blog, I just I have shown where I have gone after the rankings because I really started to dig in and look at what they measure. And actually, the guy who's over the ranking spoke at the Clinton School in Little Rock. And so I was like there up up in his grill. I was like, look, I know how your formula is. If you have few people of color, few poor students, few part time students, you can have a high ranking. Right. You can right. You can you can have a great a great ranking. And he didn't really know how to answer that question. And this this older white gentleman came up to me afterwards laughing and said, he couldn't answer your question. He thought it was hilarious because I was like, this is how this thing is set up. It's all about perpetuating privilege. And so later on, he tried to come back to us like, well, this is what America values, blah, blah, blah. So I was just pissed. I was like, this is, it's horrible. I said, because you're, I'm looking at what we're doing at Philander. I'm looking at the, the kids I have and they're coming in and we started getting some stronger kids and the graduation rate went up and they were doing, but the rankings weren't gonna move, but we were doing great work. So I was pleased with what we were doing. And so when Malcolm Gladwell says, I've been harping on these things for the longest. So look, I got these people who hacked the, 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 the um, US news rankings and they figured out the formula. So we're gonna plug some numbers in and show where you could be. And so once they gave us two billion dollars and a perfect score and we we would be number three nationally so yes, but yes. it's like you we could move up 100 spaces just with money we could do nothing else and you gave me two billion dollars i move up 100 spaces so that's fundamentally problematic and so i'm glad and a lot of people are seeing this across different i mean we get notices about this every day somebody's like man i heard the podcast blah 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 so hopefully it's going to get people to think about this very differently uh, and so I started criticizing them. The, then the first thing they did was, well, let's do a U.S. news rankings for HBCUs. So they basically use the same metrics, but they just put us in the Negro leagues together. Well, it's, <laughs> it's still the, the, the effect for the most part is the same. So the schools who are at the top are still the richest institutions. And, that's, and I'm going to tell you the, the real secret. When Mackenzie Scott gave out the first grants to HBCUs. She's given over 20. We got some McKinsey Scott money. But the first six oh, institutions were the top six on US News, best oh, oh, oh. and the six with the biggest endowments. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So they use a lot of different metrics. But initially, I don't know how they factored in those other metrics. But I know initially who got the money first, the top six. Six in order, biggest endowments. So it's like you could be that could have harmed some institutions that were just as worthy as a Howard to get money who probably needed it more since Howard gets a federal appropriation of two hundred and fifty million dollars, which is over a quarter of their annual budget comes from the federal government. So that money could have helped out another institution. But mm -hmm. based on how U.S. News rankings, they benefit because they're a wealthier institution, fewer Pell Grant students. You know, it's. So that's, I mean, it's just, it's been interesting, um, but I'm glad people are really starting to ask additional questions about the rankings. I don't know if it'll ever change, but I like the, I like the beating that we're giving them right now. Yeah, I, I love that, that quote that you gave about the perpetuation of privilege and talking about the, the Brown Ivy Leagues, which I had never really even heard of. So I was like, I guess that there, that's actually true there. And that could actually really be harmful to our other smaller institutions that, as you said, are just equally as worthy of the recognition of the honor because they're doing some of the same things that these larger institutions are doing, but with fewer resources monetarily that are available. So let's kind of talk a little bit about Dillard, its STEM programs, and where we could be doing a little bit better. So what are some of the challenges for HBCUs in general regarding building and sustaining research capacity? And how are institutions like NIH 
not really serving HBCUs and other MSIs well? How can, how can, how can, how can institutions can, like NIH that I work at do better? Right. So I, you know, I think the, the challenge is really how, how can we more equitably place talent at places like HBCU? So now mm -hmm. this, is, this is what I really like about the Nicole Hannah-Jones movie. Hopefully other people will learn from her because she recognized even Howard with this almost billion dollar endowment really didn't have a way to support what her salary would have been at UNC Chapel Hill. Mm -hmm. So she used her celebrity to say, all right, I'm going to Ford. I'm going to a couple other foundations. Look, I'm going to Howard because the UNC people piss me off. Y'all give me this money. I'm bringing $20 million with me. <laughs> you do that. I mean, so if you got people who have that capacity, who are writing those grants, who can bring in the big dollars and say, all right, I got this money. I'm going to take it to Tougaloo now. Mm -hmm. You could do that. And that's what has to happen. So I think that, you know, and I mean, NIH for us, like Dillard got a $25 million NIH grant right before I got here in 2011. So that was great for us. So we're able, and some of the researchers now who are looking at um, minority health disparities have been able to do a lot over the last year with the pandemic. So that's like been great for us to, to set up. But I think we've got to have people who are thinking strategically that, okay, even younger professionals who built up some, some capital, they, they've um, done some great research, they're able to get big grants. Just take all that and say, all right, now I'm going to build a new center, but I'm going to build it at Wiley. Yes. yes. That's the kind of thing. So it's, it's sort of out. But like I said, I really hope people will follow her model because she basically said, all right, I'm going to use my pool that I have and I'm going to go to the foundations. I'm going to raise the money so I can go work here at this black school and they ain't got to worry about nothing. They just got to give me an office. I'm putting up the money for everything else. <laughs> it's, it's the most gangster move that I, I just... I just want people to do that. That's that's how we can get some equity because the individuals will have, and there are people out there now who are at majority institutions who could do that. Just like you know what, I'm just gonna take all my stuff and move it somewhere else. That that will help, and that's how some people can really help out because you know it's it's just hard a institution on its own to say uh -huh. you know let me go out and try to you know bring in Kismekia Corbett to come work at Dillard. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not gonna be able to do that. I just I mean it's just not. You know, because she would come in at a level in terms of salary that becomes very disproportionate for your other faculty members. But if you got all outside money doing that, everybody got to just chill on that. It's like, look, she got her own money. You got we, we just roll with that because then you might be able to eat off some new money she brings in. And that's the way you sell that. But you can't just you can't just go out and just, you know, bring in the star person and then pay out of what you have. They got to help you by bringing in the money. So. I just think people, I want people to, to really look at what she did because she she created a new blueprint to really <laughs> help people with this new migration, you know, back to HBCUs. I, I love that they're able to use that level of influence that they have, their influence, their branding in order to bring recognition to uh, HBCUs and the promise and the legacy of HBCUs. But like you, you pointed out something very, very important. We don't have some of that undergirding to support this in a more sustained and a broader way, because there's so many people that I know that graduated from HBCUs where they would love the opportunity to be able to go back and take that knowledge and take that love that they have had to their undergraduate institutions. Their undergraduate institutions cannot afford them. They wouldn't be able to afford them until they retire and decide that they want to go back or they want to do some sort of engage in a summer opportunity or something like that. That's 30 years where you're losing out on the talent, where you're losing out on the innovation and the promise and potential that these individuals could bring to these institutions. I'm looking forward to working with my own HBCU to figure out how we can grow some of that talent that, well, well, how we can utilize and strategize around some of that talent that we've grown, that's been out there for 30 years now. And we're ready and primed to bring it back to our institution and make sure that it's on a bed that can sustain it as well. Right. And, you know, but and I always tell people, though, is we have to have people who are thinking strategically at the institution. So, you know, with that situation, um, Ta-Nehisi Coast is already having conversations with Wayne Frederick, who's been trying mm -hmm. to get him because he had the Howard connection. So that's good. And so then he 
using his alumni capacity brings in Nicole Hannah Jones. So he played a role, but you had to have somebody like Wayne who's there, who's going to be open and forward looking to be like, man, this is an opportunity. Let me jump on this. Because sometimes, you know, we can be slow and we trying to do things certain ways. It's like, no, we got to jump on some things. We don't need to jump through. And that's what UNC was doing. They were jumping through all these hoops. It was like, no, see, Wayne was like, I ain't got to do all that. I'm private. Let me just go on in and do this, make this happen. And I like that. So I, we've got to be thinking, you know, progressively as institutions as well and not get caught up on, well, this is how we've done this here. We got to do some things differently. We got to take some risks too. I think that's okay. I, I, I agree with that. I, I, I'm loving this conversation. You talked a little bit earlier about, um, well, I asked you a buzzword about leadership and your thoughts about leadership. And you've talked a lot about the leadership of others and how they've influenced you. I want to talk more now kind of about your own vision and your leadership style and how it's developed over time and how you really think um, that you're, or do you think that you're making a big impact in your environment? So how have your, your personality traits, your leadership styles, how does that influence how you show up in your environment to serve other people? Yeah. I mean, you know, for me, particularly, I, I don't try to micromanage everybody. They're like, I guess I have like 10 direct reports and at the cabinet level, I have six who are at the VP level. My job is to go recruit the best people I can find. And really just then I play a support role to what they need to do. So I'm still out there. I'm looking big picture. I'm, I'm thinking big picture, asking questions, getting them to be creative. So, I, you know, part of leadership is is sometimes it's asking the right questions and asking hard questions and people or there's a professor at Harvard that calls it interrogating reality. Mm. That's what I, I like to do that. You've got to ask those kind of questions and, and spur the innovation. But if you can get a really good team of people and your job becomes easy, then I really I don't have to do a lot of the, you know, <laughs> All right. like basic stuff. It's like I can really, you know, look for the opportunities, be creative, come up with some new connections with new people, open up new doors. That's, you know, I need to be playing that role. I need to be out there just trying to figure out, like, where are the opportunities? Who are the people that we need to know? Who haven't we met? Who can connect us with this person and that person? I need to be doing those kind of things and not, like, trying to manage financial aid or admissions. You know, they, they're supposed to, you know, I, I tease our admissions director because, you know, when we have an admissions day or they have certain things, I'm like, all right, she the, she can tell, talk to me any kind of way she wants to because it's her area. She the boss. <laughs> <laughs> and we all, they always laugh at me. And I was just like, um, the people from financial aid always talk to everybody any way they want to. <laughs> yeah, I was just like, I was just like, no, you the, you the boss. You tell me what I need to do. So you need me to cut this video. All right, I was shooting videos yesterday for incoming. He's like, whatever you tell me to do, because I need I need for her to be successful, so my enrollment numbers look good. So if this yeah. is what she needs me to do, I'm following her lead. She's a leader, but I gotta play my role in that. So you know, it's you know, I like to be very active and and do different things, but I want them to direct me. To tell me, all right, then what what role do I play to help this happen, and not for me to direct it? But Absolutely. you know, being a president, you know, there is a, an important role for me to play. They need to figure out how do you best use me to help you accomplish your goal, which then accomplishes the goal for the institution. Um, so that's I just I try to find a good team of people that like each other, like to have fun, and like to take risks. I got a great team, so I I can sleep well every night. And if we, something comes up, we got an issue. It's like, all right, let's figure it out. It's like you don't sweat about it. You just figure it out and keep moving. You know, you talked you talked about having fun. So now I got to ask you about how did you end up calling yourself the hip hop press? <laughs> okay, so to, to be honest, I did not come up with that. Okay? You did. I did not come up with that. I when I was introduced. As president of Philander in October of 2004, they introduced the president, you give some opening statements. And I was like, okay, here I am as your president of Philander Smith. The average age of college presidents is 58. I'm 37. I look like okay. I'm 17. Okay. So it's <laughs> like, I, I'm, I, I'm not going to operate like somebody who's a baby boomer from the greatest generation. I'm from Generation X, I'm from the hip hop generation. So there's just a different way that I will move in this role that's authentic to my generation. It doesn't make it deficient, but it's, it's you know, the sensibilities that I have from this generation, growing up in Atlanta, all of that plays into how I move and how I interact with people. And so um, a local newspaper 
um, a weekly newspaper, the next week had an article, uh, you know, Philander introduces it, uh, his hip hop president. And the, the public relations team at Philander just, they hated it. They're like, oh no, it's like, <laughs> don't say that with hip hop, the misogyny, the profanity. And I was like, no. It's cool. <laughs> I said, this is brilliant. It's brilliant. So I lean into it. And it's just people didn't know how to deal with that. I was like, no, I'm like, because how many college presidents that you know they have a brand like that? Uh, it's funny, uh, like, like we go hang out at Essence when Essence was, you know, before the pandemic. And my wife and I are walking around. And Steve Perry, who is a national, you know, educator, uh -huh. we saw him walking by. He was like, oh, hip hop president. And she hates when people do that. I'll keep telling her, like, I am, people know who this is. I am famous. <laughs> I, I told you. I told right. you. <laughs> so it's just, but it's like, yeah, it's like everybody knows that. And it's just sort of like, it's just sort of stuck. But, you know, just in terms of how I move, how I connect with, you know, how hip hop interacts with people, my connections with people in, the hip hop industry, MC Light had been on our board, Chance the Rapper spoke for commencement. I have rappers on campus all the time. I mean, it's just, but that's just, those are my people. I mean, and, and they we're having this bridge to connect with young people. So even younger artists, I've done some things with them. I mean, it's just a different way to, to engage. But I mean, when you look at America today, hey, you can't do anything without hip hop. Hip hop is ubiquitous. You, every, particularly around the holidays, Every major brand has a commercial that got some kind of hip hop feel to it. Sure does. I mean, it's I mean, it's it's just mainstream right now. It's not to me not even a big deal. Um, but I that's how it happened. I love it, how you're connecting this to your 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 approach, your authentic approach approach to your presidency, and this is a way for you to connect with your students because this is just kind of who you are. And I really I I, I love that because the name of this is authentic conversations, right? So we're talking about you and your authentic self and how you, how your authenticity, your own upbringing, the influence of other people in your life have influenced your trajectory. They influence how you interact with other people. They influence your goals. They influence your own mission as well. And I think that that's actually pretty darn awesome. Yeah, it so, works. We, we have some questions from the audience before I ask you a couple of crazy questions at the very end. Um, so one of the questions from the audience is, Dr. Kimbrough, with young African-Americans struggling to be accepted at the K through 12 level, is there a way or a mechanism that HBCUs can use or are using to form satellite schools for our kids? Yeah, that's, you know, I wrestle with that. And I'm gonna tell you why. Um, the former president of Johnson C. Smith, uh, Dor Dorothy Kowser Yancey, we talked about this at a UNCF meeting to say, what can our schools do more in terms of pipelines for K through 12 students so that they work with HBCUs and then when they finish high school, they come to us for college. She said, well, my grandmother always talked about this idea of fattening the frog for the snake, which okay. means we put a lot of effort into these programs, we do the upward bound, blah, blah, blah. And then now predominantly white schools trying to fill diversity quotas, they have more money, they come in and buy those students. And so it's like, you do all this work, it's like, yeah, Dilla did all this for me with upper bound. And then LSU comes in like, we need some black folks, full ride. And they're looking at you like, Dilla, what can you do? And it's like, okay, I can give you a full ride too. And then some schools, cause Texas A&M did this for a while, they had an additional $50,000 sitting so that if somebody matched their offer, they gave some money on top of that, on, on top wow. of that. So it, it, I mean, this is, so then you get in a bidding war that you don't have any money to bid with. So that's the challenge for us. It's like, it's good to do for the community, but you have to do it knowing that you don't, you're not guaranteed of getting a return on the investment. And so now you're saying, School with limited resources, invest some of those limited resources in the community, and you might not get a return. Mm -hmm. That's not really a good business model for us. That's a challenge. So, I mean, I think we try to find things to do to the, the campuses that do have like an upward bound program. You do some of those kinds of things that help, but that's the, the challenge. People don't understand how dirty that game is. And it's getting worse right now because there's more and more pressure from black students at predominantly white institutions saying, this school is not diverse enough. What are y'all gonna do? And they're sweating because they don't want those kids on television protesting or yep. doing big social media campaigns. So they're they're putting up money and they're buying folks left and right. And that's that's the challenge. And that, and it's not even and for a lot of those kids. It's not a good fit for them to go. So it's like, yeah, I got this money to go to this school and they get there and they're miserable. 
So it's trying to tell people, it's hard to tell people like, turn down this extra little bit of money to come to the place that's really gonna look out for you. But they get caught up and they get up caught up in the name. Oh, I got in the, you know, flagship you and I let got me money. go there. Right. But flagship you is three percent black. And then you complain in that you can't see nobody who look. It's like you knew what you bought into. That's why I keep trying to tell students and parents during our visitation days. It's like if you decide to go to a school in the cornfield like I did Miami and I love Miami. I had a great experience there and I could go the whole day and not see anybody else black. But I was a graduate student and I was cool. I was I knew who I was. I'm, I'm good with that. I'm from Atlanta. I've been around black folks all my life. So to be a, a year and a half with a mostly white environment was cool. I was OK with that. But you got kids now who go to sc schools in the cornfields in Iowa and they get mad because it's not Wakanda. It's like, no, you went, you went to you went to Asgard. You went looking for Thor. You went to Asgard. And now you mad. You can't you cannot put that on the school. So I defend those schools. You knew on the little view book, two percent black. And then you get there. We don't have black faculty. We don't have black staff. We don't have black studies. You knew that going into it. That's not the school's fault. That's your fault. If you want to go to Wakanda, here I am. I'm right here. I'm King T'Challa. I'm right here. You come see me. But don't go into the cornfields and then be like, this ain't Wakanda. No, it's not. It's not. Yeah, I, I experienced that for going from Talladega and then going to Penn State. And you're right. You can go the entire day and not see anyone else who looks like you. And when you do, you're waving from across the street. Hey, how you doing? Because you, you sometimes just need that sense of connection and connectivity and just to see somebody who may, on the slight chance, understand what your struggle is. We got another couple of questions from the audience before we have to close out. Um, so how do you consider yourself to be an innovator in your field and how are you leading change from within? So, you know, I think one of the things that I really spent a lot of time doing is really digging in to use data um, to do some innovative things. So, for example, for us, right before I got to Dillard, there was a report that said our number one reason we lose students was not because of ACT, SAT score. It wasn't because of academic performance. It was unmet financial need. Mm -hmm. So I was like, OK. And Georgia State, which is one of the most innovative institutions where I got my PhD created like this Panther retention grant, $500 kept people in school. I was like, so could you apply this to a private HBCU? So we applied the same kind of program, watched the retention rate go up, watched the graduation go, rate go up, able to get different grants on top of that to then add in different analytics as a part of that. So for me, it was, we haven't really had a lot of HBCUs use data and analytics the way that we have. Um, so I think that's a part of, you know, for me, for innovation. Uh, I think being innovative and finding ways to create community between the campus and the city with the various lecture series that I've done in the past. I had one at Philander called Bless the Mic. Here it was called Brain Food. It was just ways to, to bring different people to the community to start different kinds of conversations uh, that have been innovative. Uh, so those are the kinds of things that, you know, like I say, a lot is, is data driven. A lot is trying to figure out how do you link popular culture with um, your campus to do unique things. Like I said, having, you know, a rapper like MC Light on your board, what kind of things. She started a scholarship program that was funding $50,000 uh, for black men. So for me, I'm just I'm always looking for new and unique opportunities. And it might not be just the hottest thing people are talking about. Like right now, everybody's talking about esports. Um, uh -huh. I had a conversation about that today. Yeah, maybe. I'm skeptical on some things. I look at them a little harder. Uh, but then for me, um, using social media, um, I got more followers than any HBCU president in the country. And I was looking at your Twitter feed. It's pretty funny. Yeah, and um, and I always tell people too, and it's verified. Uh, and I would tell people too, it's like, but that was an innovative thing because the last president of LSU, I would tell people, I have four times as many followers on Twitter as a president of LSU. And he's got 40,000 students and I got 1,200. And the kinds of people that are following me are people then who can open up doors for me and the students. So mm -hmm. it was a way to say, how do I innovatively use social media for the connections? And nobody mm -hmm. was doing it like that. So for me, it was like, I would see something you know, I was, no, for example, here's a real quick example. I was driving, my son and I were going to a, a basketball tournament um, 
about an hour away and I was listening to MSNBC and Franklin Leonard who's over the blacklist that really deals with movie screenplays he was on there just talking about we don't really have enough black folks who are really in the, the, the film industry and how do we do that so I'm on go on Twitter I tweeted him yeah I heard about the things you were doing Dillard has a great film program blah 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 he yeah. hits me back we need to have a conversation we had zoom conversation I connected him with our film people boom there you go I so did that's all really that. you that's really you on Twitter that's not oh, that's, I don't, nobody that's nobody chooses that me nobody I do all of my own yeah so but that was like people don't they're not operating like that I'm like this is real time using social media I've just opened up some opportunities for my students I do that all the time people just you know people just they're out there and they're just like wait this is the president using social media to connect things for students and People, a lot of people still aren't doing that. But for me, I that love level it. of authenticity. That level of commitment is also the, the the humor, the humanistic part. And I think that that's what's missing from other uh, president social media accounts is that it seems robotic. It's not like a real person who really who really has care and concern for the issues that are impacting their students and individual individuals within their immediate community. Now, I like a, a few of the things that you said there. Um, and you kept talking about the innovative approaches. So Mackenzie Scott just gave you that Mackenzie Scott money. But let's just say that you had no limitations on funding, right? You could create your own university, University of Kimbrough or Big Brother Walt, <laughs> university, whatever you want to name it. What would you do? What would it look like? How would you build it? And who would it support? So, I mean, it would be a lot of what we do now. The, the difference in what I keep telling people now, if somebody gave me a $200, $400 million gift, I would endow all of that, spend the endowment money, and all of that would help reduce the cost so I could mm -hmm. pay for more for students to go to school. Wouldn't have to increase tuition. So it would almost be like there is a model for this. Berea College in Kentucky is basically operates like that, where you can go for free. They pay, they got an endowment that covers those students. It's a like work type college. They wouldn't have to do that, but that would be revolutionary for black people to have a place where you could go. You don't have the resources because you're. It, it becomes a generational change that you're going to graduate with no debt. Okay. Listen. So if you can graduate no debt, you, you're eligible for Pell. We would collect the Pell. And then between our scholarship program, outside scholarships, and then the gap money that we would have, so the, the problem would be everybody named mom would be trying to come to deal with it. Listen, <laughs> so I'd be, be trying to have more right, babies so they right, could come back right. and attend your university. Yeah, so that would be that's that's the only problem with that. So that means I have to probably get somebody to give me the two billion dollars at me. But and you, you have unlimited dollars. You right. unlimited. Yeah, so if I got unlimited, that's what I would do. I mean, just to have that. So you would have a place where you could be a place where you, you know, to have the same kind of programs and things that we're doing now. But the difference is, you know, you're going to graduate 100 percent, no debt. 100% no debt, your baby's in a place where they're being fed from in from the inside, inside out. and outside. That's right. That's, yes. That's, I mean, that would be, a place like that would be revolutionary. A place that you want to send your own kids. Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So last question. What do you want for your legacy to be? So when people ask that question, I always, it's going to be like, hard. I'm not dead yet. <laughs> yeah, it's no, it's going to be hard to know. I, I always base it on the students who I've had to impact directly over the course of my career, not even just as a president. That's that's the legacy. The things that they do, those are the things when they go back. Like, so one of my students from Albany State, when I was vice president there, after her freshman year, I got the job at, at Philander and she sat in my office on the couch and just cried. And so she decided, so I came back for her graduation. She wanted to be a lawyer. So Adria had been working with her. So she comes out to Arkansas to go to law school at the University of Arkansas. She's like three hours away. Um, and so we just followed the whole, my daughter's middle name is because she gave it her middle name. So they both are Nicole, their middle names. So I follow her whole career. Well, this past December, she was sworn in as the first woman and the first African-American to be a judge in Richmond County, Georgia, which is Augusta, which is a place that's majority black. In the uh -huh. history of that city, they've never had a uh -huh. woman or a black person be a judge. And so I'm sitting there, and so we're watching it, you know, on YouTube, 
and she just they're bawling and, and she's sworn in and she's talking about me and Adria as her mentors because I kept telling her daddy like she like my child I just can't write her off on my taxes I mean it's <laughs> it, but it's like you know through a whole when she got engaged you know it's funny she's she's an AKA as well when she when she got engaged she texts me the top of this that you you a smart man Look, <laughs> She, she, she texts me a picture of the engagement ring and I text back, okay. And she said, Doc, you're not going to say congratulations? I said, I hadn't met him yet. So we had to go have dinner at Papa yeah. Dole. So I, I was like, I'm not playing. It's like, I don't know, you know, I don't know if this is congratulations I'm, I'm or not. With you. So, right. Yeah. So, but I mean, we were at the wedding. So when you just watch somebody like that and she's just bawling and she's just thanking you profusely and Adrian's sitting there crying too. It's just like, that's your legacy. Cause you like this girl, I remember just as a freshman, she's just trying to figure it all out. And now she's a judge and she's not even 40. And I'm just like, I had a little hand in that. You know, and for yes. her to be like, you, you, this is you, you know, you really help, you know, get, help me get to a place I didn't think I could get to. Those are the kinds of things that if I don't do anything else, helping people like that get to where they want to be, that's it. It ain't got to be my name on no building or nothing like that. Those stories like that, just like I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. I and our viewers have been blessed by your brilliance blessed by your humor, blessed by just getting a little snippet of your legacy and you fulfilling your legacy in so many brilliant ways and so many given ways that you don't even understand how you've touched so many lives and will do so moving on into the future. Now, the way that we close this out is a versus. You ain't got to sing, even though I hear you play piano and you got real good pitch. Um, so next time we have you back, can you sing? Yeah, yeah, you're gonna no, say no. I, no, so I when I was no when I was young, I sang with the Atlanta Boy Choir and I toured Europe twice. That means, that's, yeah. but that's before my voice changed. So <laughs> I mean, I can carry a tune, but and I'm a musician, but I don't sing. Not like people who can really sing. No, I can carry a tune, but yeah, I I, I think I'm legit. We're, we're gonna have a duet next time. We're gonna practice okay. before we answer. We'll embarrass ourselves, but let's get All on right. with verses here. So Gentilly or French Quarter? Uh, Gentilly. Instagram or Twitter? Twitter. Football or basketball? Basketball. Ice tea or lemonade? Sweet tea. That, that, see, right there. Langston Hughes or Ralph Ellison? Hmm. Hmm. That's a good one. Maybe Ralph Ellison. Outcast or Goody Mob? Oh, Outcast all the way. I say the same thing. Saints or Falcons? I plead the fifth. <laughs> Osley Brothers are over when in fire. Oh, the elements. Last one. Rap music or bounce music? Oh, rap. <laughs> what, what, what? I agree with you, but I've been getting into that bounce lately. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate your time. I've had fun. If nobody else did, I know I did. Thank you very much. And we're hoping that we're going to be able to catch up with you again soon. All right. Sounds good. Thank you.